I, I would like to begin by uh, thanking you for being here. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, my colleague and friend, the Chief of Police for Montgomery County, Tom Major, for joining us here today. Uh, obviously, today uh, began considerably differently uh, than the men and women who had been working on this case for a year thought it was going to turn out. Uh, I will tell you I'm honored as we stand here today to be with the, the Wallen family uh, that are standing behind me, along with their daughter Jen and their son-in-law John. Uh, and there are other victims in this case besides uh, Laura, besides Reed, the child she was carrying. There are many victims, the people that stand with me. And there, was, there, there are a lot of collateral victims of the work of Mr. Tessier over many, many years. Uh, the young woman uh, who was the other young woman to whom he was engaged was with us today. And I will tell you, I, uh, I, she's been with us this morning. Uh, and is not standing with me now uh, for personal reasons, uh, but she is every bit as much a victim as any of the other people that stand with me right now at this time. Uh, today, uh, we were supposed to have the opening statements in what was anticipated to be a three-week trial to show the overwhelming evidence that had been gathered over the last year by members of the Montgomery County Police Department and members of my own office showing that Tyler Tessier was the individual who killed Laura Wallen back on September 3rd of last year. Uh, we were robbed this morning of the opportunity to allow the public to know the true nature and details of this crime, which would have been set out over three weeks by the fact of his own cowardice when he took his own life sometime between 4.45 and 5.55 this morning at the Montgomery County Jail. Uh, I will tell you, he was being housed at the jail in one of the typical pods at the jail. Uh, there may, these are individual cells. Uh, Mr. Tessier was not in isolation. He was in a single cell area on a pod where 15 other inmates were also housed. Uh, he had been checked and seen by members of the jail alive and well in his cell less than 10 minutes before he was discovered uh, deceased. He had gotten up at about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and showered between 4 and 4.15. Uh, he'd been seen again about 4.36. He was given breakfast at 4.45 and was found dead in his cell at 4.55. Um, there were no sa signs of foul play. Now, I will tell you out of respect, uh, the police have their work to do because any death that occurs in custody must be fully investigated. But there are no signs of foul play, and this case has all the apparent signs of a suicide. Uh, I would also indicate to you that there are a series of notes that give strength to my statement that this appears to be a suicide because there are multiple notes that I will not go into a detail out of respect for the police investigation. It's not complete. There will come a time when it is completed that we will release those letters to you, but because the investigation is ongoing and some of the individuals to whom the notes were written have not seen those notes, out of consideration for those individuals, we feel we have to share the notes with them. And when the investigation is done, you will see the notes that he wrote. Uh, clearly, when you read the notes, you will know that he had been contemplating for some period of time taking his own life. It appeared quite, we do not, they're not, the notes are not dated notes. But other information that we've gathered through other sources today lead us to believe that he had been speaking to other family members about those notes for some period of time. These notes were not written I would suggest in the last 24 hours, probably over the last several weeks or days. Um, today would have been a reckoning uh, for Mr. Tessier. Today would have been a reckoning. Because for the first time, an individual who I think showed every signs of being a psychopath, he had psychopathic behavior that he carried on as he maintained a dual relationship with two women, one for 10 years, a second for seven years. 
lying to virtually every single person in his life, to Tyler Tessier, lying was like breathing. He lied about everything. Uh, this case was meant, if it went to trial, you would have seen about 10 to 12 hours of video and audio tape from Mr. Tessier. And I will tell you, there are so many stories, so many lies, and so many changes to what he said happened in this case. Uh, it is, it's, it's impossible to catalog all the lies and all the people to whom he, in fact, did lie to maintain this dual existence, this dual relationship uh, with two women in particular, but others as well. Uh, the evidence against uh, Mr. Tessier includes, and we were not going to use this at trial, and some of you who covered the, um, the motions hearings are aware of this. There was a statement made by Mr. Tessier on September the 13th, the day that he was arrested, where he admitted he shot Ms. Wallen in the back of the head, of the head with a 22 caliber weapon. He made that admission. For a variety of legal reasons, that piece of evidence would not have been used at trial, but the evidence against him remained overwhelming. There also was a text that he, uh, that he wrote to the other young woman, not Laura Wallen, the Sunday before uh, the killing took place. The killing did take place on the Sunday before Labor Day last year. We're, we're almost exactly a year away from when this took place. Uh, the anniversary of Laura's death passed earl earlier this week. Uh, and what had happened was Laura Wong grew suspicious, as she had on many other occasions, about whether or not he was carrying on a relationship with another woman. And so she reached out to that other woman and said, I need to speak to you woman to woman about what's happening here. She didn't reveal that she was pregnant at the time, but asked this woman to meet with her. That woman became, was told Mr. Tessier she'd been contacted by Laura Wallen. In a series of texts back and forth between the other woman, the defendant at one point in time says, I could literally kill her for what she's done. That statement was a statement made in a text to the other woman approximately one week before he executed Miss Wallen in a field in Gaithersburg adjacent to a farm where he worked regularly. Uh, I, I, you know, I've, some of you know that I asked uh, for us to do a, a site visit uh, to the location where Ms. Wallen's body was found. I, I will tell you, it's an overwhelming experience to walk that 1.2 miles back, go up and down those hills, go down into a ravine and see where she was buried. No one who was not familiar with that location would have selected that location for her to be killed. The irony was, the irony was, in the week after he had killed her, in the week after he had killed her, the defendant, in a separate conversation, was talking to some other individuals about a friend that they had in common who was having problems with a boyfriend. And the people in this joint kind of group conversation, this was on the 7th or 8th of September, she was killed on the 5th, on the 8th of September, was talking about, well, you know what? Uh, if we kill him, this guy who was abusing his girlfriend, there's lots of fields where bodies can be buried in Montgomery County. That was in a separate conversation about a separate person. Um, may I say, uh, uh, I know you probably have questions. I, I want to just, again, I oftentimes sit here and, and tell you how extraordinary the police department is for Montgomery County. Uh, but I've been doing it about 38 years. I've listened to some interviews, uh, and I've, I've watched the way the men and women of this wonderful department work. Uh, this is among their finest hours. Uh, the the, the uh, interviews that were done of Mr. Tessier, and there were n numerous interviews, were extraordinarily professionally done, catching him in lie after lie after lie. Uh, and it was some of the best police work and best interviewing I've ever heard in my entire career. Chief, I want to thank the men and women of your department for the wonderful work they did and acknowledge how extraordinary they were. Uh, I'd also, may I say, and, and there's so many, some of the detectives, I know Detective Janney, Detective Colbert, uh, 
Katie Leggett. Uh, look, I, I could read you a list of 100 people who are responsible for why we're here today. But I also want to thank uh, Mary Herdman uh, and, and, and uh, Donna Fenton, who are the two lawyers in my office. These are extraordinarily talented women. Let me tell you, they've lived and breathed this case for a very long time. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm very proud. I, I am disappointed for them that they didn't have the opportunity as professional attorneys to, to make the full presentation so you would know the full weight of what they did to help bring justice to the Wallen family. But I'm honored by the work they've done and, and honored to work with the men and women of the police department every day. We're going to do something extraordinary here today that we've never done before. Uh, we have uh, segments of a PowerPoint that I want to outline for you, if you'll bear with us for a, a little bit, some of the evidence that we would have detailed during the course of this trial. I'll take a couple of your questions, let some of the other people talk, but we're going to come back and we're going to do a PowerPoint for, for you, trying to summarize uh, the depth and the breadth and the quality of the evidence that was gathered against Ty Tyler Tessier, because we think it would be a shame, robbed of the opportunity to prove his guilt in a courtroom, which we would have welcomed, for you not to know the wealth of the evidence that was gathered against this man. There should be no question in no one's mind in this county that this was Laura Wallen's killer. Uh, having said that, I'd like... I'd like to call upon Mark Wallen to come forward and make a few comments. Mark? Hi, thank you all for attending today. Um, our daughter Laura was love and light. She is absolutely missed and we, we were robbed of the trial, but we were also robbed of not having a trial for our grandson, who was also murdered. The, the legislators in Maryland have not seen fit to agree on anything about the horrible problems there are with killing pregnant women and the fact that it is a major problem in the state of Maryland. Um, we, it, it has been a year, almost to September 3rd, where, where we have been waiting for this day, and uh, it has been a very difficult year for our entire family. Um, we have been uplifted by our faith community and by the other the, the members of Howard County that have totally supported us through our endeavors and meals and gifts and people just totally reaching out to us in the most kind and supportive ways and to that I, I want to thank the community and our faith community. Um, Laura was a wonderful remarkable woman and I don't, I don't believe that there is such a thing as closure but it, the year, including today, has been a day where it's feel, it, it feels like people have thrown bricks at our head and we've had to dodge. And at this point, we can move on and we can hopefully remember our daughter as the wonderful woman that she was and we will not, unfortunately, know our grandson, Reed, but uh, it, it is a, a tough day for our family to, to not have this trial happen and I want to thank the Montgomery County Police and the State's Attorney's Office. They've been so supportive to us and have been absolutely phenomenal and thank you. Uh, Laura's mother, Gwen Wallen. I mostly just wanted to thank everybody in the community and our law enforcement, um, the, the schools that Laura taught at, Wild Lake High School and Murray Hill Middle School, but mostly um, John McCarthy from the state's attorney, our state's attorney, and Mary Herdman and Donna Fenton for their amazing work. 
I anticipated this day, but I dreaded this day too. Because of the rules of how the trial was going to go, I was not going to be able to be in the courtroom while my daughter, Jen, described to the world her wonderful sister. So for me, that was especially hard because I felt I had already not been able to protect Laura. And again, I would not be able to protect Jennifer. I also asked John McCarthy yesterday if it would be OK when he asked me about my family, if I would tell the world that I have two daughters, Jennifer and Laura. People say, I'm sorry for your loss, but I want you all to know Laura's not lost. She's with her savior, and I will be with her one day. And the second thing I asked was, will it make defense attorney angry if I tell him that I have three grandsons because till the day I die I will have had two daughters and three grandsons Reed being our third grandson and Mr. McCarthy said you absolutely will tell your story and so I'm telling you now that as awful as today is I feel at peace because I worried for my family and I worried for my other two grandsons to have such a diabolical human, if you can call him that, still in the world. But again, I also have immense gratitude because we're taught in our faith that God only gives you what you can handle. And I kept thinking, it's getting to be too much. It's just getting to be too much. And today I feel grateful that God is merciful and has given us the ability to move on and talk about Laura and the wonderful things that she's done um, in the world. Thank you. Jen Cotty, Laura's sister. I'm not as good with my, so I have notes. Um, Good afternoon. I am so very thankful and grateful to have the opportunity to speak to you for a moment. My name is Jennifer Cotty, and Laura Wallen is my beautiful and profoundly special sister. What I want to say is thank you. Thank you to law enforcement, to Katie, Mark, and Buck. You all brilliantly are why we have her back and why some families never get Laura back in the first place. You found my sister, and that is such a gift. The, all, to all of the detectives, police officers, forensic analyzers, and tech experts, thank you for all of your hard work. We only know a fraction of all of the tedious details that needed to be figured out. To Donna, Mary, and John, words can never express how eternally grateful we are. You are three of the most brilliant minds we have ever had the pleasure and honor of working with to bring Tyler to justice. To our family, friends, and coworkers, church family, and even perfect strangers, thank you for your prayers and support throughout all of this last year. We live in the most wonderful and supportive community. Laura, I love you and I miss you every single day. I was so looking forward to experiencing the incredible journey of motherhood with you. And for me, finally becoming an aunt. And I think that I am an aunt today still. You and Reed are at peace and our family is safe now. And today we finally get to rebuild our life and only remember your loving presence as nothing but joy in God's perfect light. Thank you all. And finally, uh, John Cotty, uh, Laura's brother-in-law. Uh, I'd like to start as well by thanking uh, everybody, but first and foremost, my amazing in-laws and my wife and my two children at home. Uh, we've been through a lot this past year. Um, I'd like to thank the law enforcement. Everybody's been amazing. All of our attorneys, uh, the media has been respectful. Uh, it's, it's been hard and uh, we're able to kind of move forward a little bit uh, after today. 
Uh, last Labor Day started like any other of the previous nine, uh, celebrating my wedding anniversary and uh, coaching football Friday nights under the lights. And uh, soon after that game ended on Friday night, the last time I saw Laura and the last um, text message that I received from her, I'll quote it for you because I still have it. Um, it says, happy anniversary on becoming my brother 10 years ago. And yes, also marrying my sister, that too, heart emojis. Uh, there was never in-law involved in our relationship. Um, she was uh, my sister and she, as she would tell everybody, I was her brother and that's how it was. And um, we're gonna miss her. She was a uh, amazing person, daughter, teacher, uh, sister, and uh, she was an amazing aunt to my two boys at home. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing is that, you know, you're never prepared for this and you always think in your head what you'll say if you have the opportunity and what you'll tell somebody. And I've said for the last year that I was gonna be completely positive and not let my emotions get the best of me. And if I ever had the chance to speak to him, what would I say? Um, and this morning when my phone rang, and my wife told me the news, um, it became completely clear as to what I had to say and what I needed to do. And that basically was to summarize uh, to her that he had been not showing up for anything important for 10 years. Birthdays, holidays, anniversaries, he had never shown up. So why would he show up today? And um, I'd like to just say that he stood our family up for the last time today. Thank you. Can I say, we, we want to get to uh, the PowerPoint presentation and show you some of the evidence. I'll entertain a couple of questions quickly. We got Kevin Lewis, ABC 7. Okay. John, I just wanted to know, and I think the question on everyone's mind is, after all of these, this last year, and this, the purported phone calls and trying to delay this trial, putting the family through so much, not pleading guilty, only just to apparently take his own life. As you talked about this in your office, what's the best Look, the man is a psychopath. He literally lies about stuff that it doesn't, it's meaningless to lie about. He has been able to deceive and manipulate virtually everybody in these different universes that he kept spinning all the time. Uh, I, he continues to lie, even to this day, to some of the people closest to him. I think today was where it was all gonna crush down on him and the weight, he knew the discovery, he knew the evidence, and he knew today was the reckoning. And uh, I think he took the coward's way out, not being able to sustain himself and confront and deal with all the other people that he had been lying to, deceiving and manipulating for all these years. And so why today? Because Donna, Donna was gonna stand up and for two hours lay out the evidence against him that was gonna make him into a horrid creature who had committed an unspeakable act. He had killed a woman he pretended to love and took the life of his own child. Look, part of the evidence in this case, by the way, is that that child was his. He was the father. There is no other father. He murdered the woman and his own child. Got Mike Holbrook, uh, uh, Billy JC 13. Have you ever seen a case like this? And can you say whether Mr. Tessier was on suicide by? Uh, may I, can I say, I, I, I apologize for not raising that issue before. You know, I, we were watching him in court yesterday. We saw no change, changes in his demeanor. I did speak briefly to his defense attorney and asked him if he had noticed anything. The answer is no. No one in, in the jail saw anything. I, I will tell you that there was no observed conduct on behalf of Mr. Tessier that would have indicated that what happened this morning was about to happen. And that's whether you're talking about the, Look, we listened to his jail calls last night. He made calls last night from the jail to his mother. We listened to it this morning, and he, he was talking about what clothes he was going to wear to court today. So uh, there was nothing that would have given you the hint that this was a man about to take his own life. Now, if, you go, if we had gone through his cell, read his handwriting, read those notes, we might have had a different impression. But uh, there was nothing that gave us reason to, that it was necessary to put him on suicide watch. In his cell. This morning? Yeah, they're found in his cell. Uh, they're, 
there, there, are more, there was more than one note, and uh, they were in a, a series of envelopes, and each envelope contained more than one note. But beyond that, I'm, you know, the, again, I wait for the police to release the details concerning what's in the notes and to whom they were written. Uh, they did. They did not. Okay. Oh, please, yeah. Uh, Kay Damara, WBAL. Um, is, uh, we spoke to some jurors. There were two um, who were, were wondering who will be held accountable. This person wouldn't be. And I know that there was a lot. We don't know all your evidence, but we know that there's a lot of uh, other, you know, a lot of people who owned the property and talked to them. Would there be any sort of. Any no, I, can, can, I, let, can I say. I do not believe that there's any other evidence that would suggest there was any other person that was involved in this killing, that there, I, I don't believe there's anybody else who was chargeable in this matter. We don't think that there was, a, look, he was a pretty isolated guy. He didn't have a lot of friends. He didn't, so he, look, he tried to enlist uh, after he killed Laura at about 9.34 in the morning on the Sunday after he killed her. He did text somebody to help him clean up a mess and help him move a car at night to Baltimore. He was looking for some help getting rid of Laura's car in Baltimore, but he didn't have a lot of friends. He, he had some friends, but any people he had, he kept them isolated. No one else is criminally implicated in this case but Tyler Tessier. Here okay, we got Chris Gordon with NBC4. Uh, I think what members of the public would like to know and are struggling with was how does a man uh, was about to stand trial for murder, uh, commit suicide in a jail uh, that has safeguards and, and, if I'm not mistaken, had a recent suicide yeah. uh, in July uh, of a man convicted for first degree murder for killing a pregnant fiance and sentenced to life without parole. That was in July. Here we are in September. How could this happen? Uh, may, may I say again? Uh, I, I think that particular question is better directed to corrections, and I would, and, 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 and but I, again, the only thing I can tell you is that there was not information that I am aware of that would have indicated that Mr. Tessier was con contemplating doing this, uh, and I, I, I appreciate your question. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, again, I, I can't speak to anything that would have indicated uh, an alarm bell was going off for us, but again, I, I think that's, I, I understand your question, but I think that's better directed to them. Neil Augenstein, WTOP. Um, Mr. Wallen, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Tessier, is uh, dead in Maryland. He could not have shot him before that time. But he has died without hearing the word guilty. Uh, your thoughts on, on that? It is extremely frustrating for everyone who has worked for a year on this case. Um, we were anxious to try this case. We would have loved to put forth all of the evidence uh, in this case. And we feel, look, in a much different way, we feel robbed of the opportunity uh, to show what this case was all about. I, I would say frustration, uh, maybe not surprise. Maybe if you knew the true character of Tyler, Maybe it's not even surprising because of his character, but uh, uh, I, I think frustrated, disappointed that we don't have the opportunity to try the case. We worked so hard to prepare. You got Scott Broom with WSA 9. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I say, can I say? I think that we will touch upon that in the presentation. It was part of the statement made on the 13th that we were not going to use. He did talk about being abducted by three men, and yes, we will talk about okay. that in the context of questions. Bob Barter, Fox Five. Yeah. If, if Mr. Tessier had admitted his involvement in this at one point, you said he reported that he couldn't. There, 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 there was such an overwhelming. Uh, wealth of information that showed he was involved in this. There was a question, whenever you're trying a case, you want to make sure that if it ever gets appealed, 
it gets upheld. Uh, there was an issue that we thought was a, a, a close issue as to whether or not there was some question about whether he had invoked his right to an attorney. We, li we read the transcripts, we listened to it, we researched it, we talked among ourselves, and we thought, you know what? Our case against them is so good, we won't even use that, and that's a heck of a thing to walk away from. Someone's admitting that they shot somebody in the back of the head. That's how strong the evidence against this guy was. So, John, he admitted it here on the morning of the trial, and killed himself. Why did it come this far? Was there ever any plea negotiation? He never, there was, there was never any plea negotiations. There was never any plea negotiations in this case. Uh, no discussion, no off. Look, he, he contends uh, he's not guilty and wanted a trial. And so there was nothing to discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, um, can I say to you, I think even his final version is not true. I mean, parts of it are true but parts of it are not true.